Welcome to Breaking Banks. Welcome to Breaking Banks, the number one fintech podcast and radio show globally. Uh, we are very fortunate to have the team from Plaid back with us this week. We're going to be talking all of the things that sort of happened during the pandemic and uh, in the last year. And then in the second half, look at some of the predictions for 2022 and how that's going to pan out. Um, so, um, you know, it's it's the time of the year for doing that stuff, right? Reflecting on what's happened this year and uh, looking at what's happening next year. Of course, we had the biggest year ever in FinTech tech if you take it in respect to venture capital um, investments and um, also, you know, um, the number of uh, big, big funding rounds talking, you know, um, some of them close to a billion dollars in funding rounds, uh, Revolut, um, uh, N26, New Bank, who is now going through their uh, process for an IPO in, in the US. You know, tons of activity. Q1 was a record uh, VC round for funding, uh, re record quarter for funding. Um, and then it was beaten in Q2 with 38 point, uh, 30 .8 billion in funding. So um, big funding rounds for FinTech all round and uh, lots, of, uh, lots of interesting traction happening. I, you know, I don't think we can say we're we're sort of just in startup mode anymore. You know, we're talking about some of the largest uh, financial institutions in the world now who are fintechs. So um, big changes. Anyway, let me let me uh, introduce our uh, friends from Plaid who are joining. John Pitts, he's the global head of policy for Plaid. John, welcome back. Great to be on again, as always, Brett. And uh, Raja uh, Chakravorty, um, financial institutions mid market lead for Plaid. Uh, welcome back, Raja. Thanks so much, Brett. Great to be on again. No problem. Um, so, um, guys, um, you know, just like on that topic, um, you know, uh, uh, there, there was a lot of conversation before the pandemic. A lot of incumbents were saying, you know, there, there's, um, you know, just wait till these fintechs have to deal with a crisis. You know, that was the, that was sort of the catch cry, right? Now we've seen, um, you know, uh, it, obviously, it puts some fintechs under pressure, but generally, how would you assess that overall the fintech market, including, you know, yourselves with Plaid, um, you know, how have you guys survived the, uh, the pandemic? Um, you know, John, did you want to jump in first on that? Sure. Happy to, Brett. Uh, and, you know, the I think the saying from someone much smarter than me is, um, you know, it doesn't matter uh, what you're swimming in until the tide goes out and then you can tell who's wearing a bathing suit or not. And the tide went out uh, and it turned out that uh, not only were fintechs wearing bathing suits, but in uh, many cases, they were better equipped to deal with that down market than some of the incumbents. And the real driver there, I think, was fintechs are digital first, right? And there's nothing right. like a... Uh, requirement for all of us to shift all of our lives into the digital space to really let you know who's made the big investments in digital financial services and digital customer service. And so um, things are going great. We've had a fantastic year at Plaid, although really when I say we've had a fantastic year, what I mean is everyone in the ecosystem has had a fantastic year because as an infrastructure company, we thrive when our customers thrive. And we've seen really tremendous growth from them this year. And I think if I had to really say one thing about 2021, looking backwards at it, it was, this is the year where sort of for the big players, open banking and digital financial services went from being a question to an answer, right? It was um, all of the banks, the largest banks are now, they are betting on an open banking future in the US. They're not really resisting it as much anymore. Part of that is policy, right. and we can talk about that uh, and how policy has shifted in the US. But part of it is also really consumer behavior. Plaid does a survey every year on consumer adoption of fintech. We just released the most recent one uh, in late August. And fintech has more users in the U.S. than Netflix right now, right? And that is in a, a very that in a very short period of time, right? It's gone from non-existent to completely ubiquitous. That we are now at this mass adoption moment. And one of the things I hope we can talk a little bit about today, and Raja particularly can talk about, is like now the question is, 
for the big players, it's here. How do we make sure that everyone gets the benefits of this digital transformation in financial services from you know, the smallest bank and from, most importantly, the consumers and the customers of the smallest banks and the smallest institutions in this country? But, but that sort of that wave really crested this year. And now it's a question of if this is the future, how do we make it work for everyone? Absolutely, Raja. What, what did you want to add? What, who do you think? Obviously, you know, Plaid's done quite well, but of the other fintechs in the space, you know, what was notable for you over the last year in terms of, um, you know, uh, winners and losers? Yeah, I mean, um, that's a perfect tee up, John. I appreciate that. You know, I, I think to step back for a second, I, I think we've talked about our mission at Plaid, and the idea is around the democratization of financial services through technology. I mean, fundamentally, we just make it easy to securely connect people's banks to the apps they want to use. And we've talked about this important shift in how consumers are kind of attempting to take control of their financial health. And we've been seeing that trend of ind individuals looking to access and share their financial information to unlock new experiences and tools for some time. Um, what has been great from our perspective is I think we we built this foundation of connections with financial institutions of all types. And certainly over the past year or so, we've been really focused on how we deliver this value back to banks. And, um, and, and I think that has really been um, something that we have seen articulated well uh, in the use case. I think there's kind of three effects that we've seen, and certainly we'll lean on the same report that John talked about, the FinTech effect um, that, we, that, that happened over the, the past year. The first is, the value that people are receiving from fintech is driving a permanent shift to digital, right? Like the pandemic acceleration towards fintech has staying power. We've seen that fintech improves people's financial well-being unequivocally, and people are going to continue down this path. I mean, people are using fintech to address both financial goals as well as challenges. I think second, um, very compelling, is that fintech is unequivocally making finance both more inclusive and more social. Something that's really important to me is this concept of financial inclusion. And that's been an acute focus recently, um, certainly as racial disparities and the impact they have on economic and social inequalities have kind of come under renewed scrutiny. Access to affordable financial products is absolutely critical to the fundamental, fundamental creation of wealth. Absolutely. But historically, access to financial services has been severely limited for many minority populations. And I think what we've seen is that the emergence of fintech has helped underserved groups solve their biggest financial challenges. And we've seen that accelerate. Um, and then finally, I think we've seen that FinTech is integrating, integrating finance into people's everyday lives in an increasingly seamless way. So as usage is going up, this perceived trust gap between FinTechs and traditional finance is narrowing and innovations by FinTech to deliver both control and automation to empowered consumers to manage their financial lives more seamlessly as part of their everyday activities. Now, guys, you know, one thing that we need to do is we need to really sort of separate what's happening in the US market versus, you know, what's happening globally. Obviously, there's been some success stories in the US, but we've recently seen N26 retreat from uh, the US. Monzo did the same. Um, but offshore, you've got um, you know, fintechs being so disruptive in the Chinese market that, um, you know, significant controls were put in place and, and significant attention to the tech fins. Um, just to put it in perspective, in 2020, we don't have the 20, you know, we don't have running 2021 numbers yet, but in 2020, the two um, uh, major mobile wallets schemes, Alipay and Tencent WeChat Pay, did $52 trillion of mobile payments. Um, China's GDP is what, 16 trillion? So, you know, like many times more than um, uh, their GDP. Uh, we're talking about 35 trillion maybe for plastic cards globally. So, you know, double, Chinese mobile wallets already double the entire plastic card load in the US. 7 trillion of plastic cards and 300 billion of mobile payments in 2020. And so, um, you know, in, in many ways, the real fintech action is happening offshore. You could, you could argue that, um, you know, maybe, you know, John, you've done, you've spent some time in Europe with Plaid as well, but, you know, what, what's your take in terms of, we've got, you know, New Bank in LATAM and, you know, and, and to your point, Raj, on financial inclusion and WeBank in Shenzhen and, 
you know, um, N26 having restrictions placed on it in Germany because it's now approaching the, being the second largest bank by market cap and they're limited to 70,000 new customers a month there because the regulator's concerned. You know, why, why this sort of, um, why is it that the US is struggling with some of this stuff? do you think compared with offshore? So I, I wouldn't say that we are struggling here. I think actually it's a slightly different dynamic than that, Brett. And the way I would describe the dynamic is in some markets, the regulation has come earlier. Um, and in the US, it's been much more of a commercial driven process. And I think this this gets a little bit into sort of the moment that we've hit, one of the reasons that I think most of the banks have shifted their posture on open banking in the US is it's now clear that a regulatory structure is coming to the US market. And the interesting dynamic is I actually don't agree that the US is struggling from a regulatory perspective. I think the big open question is who is going to be the first jurisdiction to act at the right time with the right regulation on open banking. Because I think what you've seen with some of the pullbacks from uh, European fintechs entering into the US market is they grew up in a European market with licenses and a bunch of other really clear regulations that guided their business. The US doesn't have all of those regulations. So it's unclear how you can translate your business from one market to another market. And I think the big open question for next year is which market becomes the dominant regulatory market for fintech. Uh, I don't think it's going to be China because I think the the Chinese government has made their opinion clear on how much will it, you know how much leeway they're willing to give that sector and they're now in pullback mode. Uh, but when you look at let's just look at something like privacy in the U.S., most U.S. companies follow GDPR because they have right. to, right? They have right. to follow it in Europe. And so in, in some ways, the US lost the global race for who the real privacy regulator is gonna be. The European Union is the global pri privacy regulator. And I think there's now a similar race happening in FinTech and open finance as to who is going to get it right first. Australia is trying, Brazil is trying, Europe, Europe is already trying, Canada and the US are gonna try next year. And I think it's an open question as to who gets their uh, gets the answer right quickest? No, I, I think Roger, you, you, you jump in. I, I think that's fair, John. Um, although, having said that, you know we don't have fintech charters in the US. Pretty much every other developed market does, right? And uh, you know, part of the you know N twenty six and um, Monzo pushback. Part of that was that they really felt dealing with US regulators compared with what they'd had offshore was was extremely problematic and much more complicated than it needed to be. But Raja, jump in. Yeah, um, certainly. It, one thing I would just say, and obviously John is the policy expert, I'm very excited to hear how he goes further down this topic. But from a consumer perspective in the US, like open finance is here to stay, right? You know, Absolutely. Dodd-Frank 1033, has certainly solidified the right of the consumer to access their data for use across the financial services ecosystem. And, and the reality is that consumers are already choosing FinTech use cases because it is just fundamentally easier for them in their financial lives, like using Venmo to pay friends or investing with Acorns. And so um, almost regardless of the regulatory environment, this consumer shift in how they want to behave is going to impact how banks try to address retention for those consumers, right? So like, if a bank won't enable these use cases, they're, they're now, that are actually now core, actually, to how consumers engage with their mobile devices, consumers are going to go find institutions that let them do it. You know, conversely, so. enabling these services help keeps consumers engaged with their financial institution. And I think importantly, helps maintain this kind of battle over account primacy, by helping financial institutions stay at the center of their financial lives. So while there's this regulatory and policy framework that is gonna govern how this happens, the, the, the consumer um, lens has already moved in that direction. And I think that's gonna be a major driving force as it relates to ensuring that we're continuing innovation and driving down this path in the US. John, would love to hear kind of additional thoughts on your end too. Yeah, and, and you know, Brett, I think the, the thing that you said that I 
completely agree with is that some fintechs who want to get a bank charter, right, because there is no fintech charter in the U.S., have found that really challenging and have decided like the the juice is not worth the squeeze. Right. Completely agree on that. What I think that misses a little bit is that in the U.S., there's a huge world of non-bank and a lot of fintechs have found immense success without getting a bank charter. So let, let's just look at like a couple of, of examples, you know, um, Quicken Loans uh, is now the single largest mortgage originator uh, in the U.S. Um, and they're a non-bank. Uh, they set a goal of 60% of U.S. mortgages by the end of next year. That's an, a very ambitious goal, but that's now the majority of U.S. mortgages by a non-bank. The majority of, cons- not the majority, it's, I believe it's now 45% of consumer loans are not made by a bank. They are made by non-bank lenders who are giving consumers, in fact, better rates and better service in many instances than banks are, or lending to consumers, and this goes to Raja's point earlier, lending to consumers who banks traditionally won't lend to and have said like, sorry, you're not our market. Uh, You live in the wrong neighborhood or you have the wrong background. So I think there is a real dynamic in the U.S. of this sort of tension of both bank and non-bank and innovation is happening in both places. And they actually feed off each other in a way that I don't think we have really seen in the European market uh, to the same degree where you've got those sort of like those different elements attacking the same problem the same way. Actually, this week, there was a really interesting example. I'm sure you saw it, Brett. where Cap One became the latest bank. Uh, say, yes, so the we are, fees. We're ending yeah. our overdraft. Uh, we're not going to charge for overdraft fees anymore. And uh, would through, they have done that if it hadn't been for the pressure from the fintech? I, I, I think there is no, I mean, so one, uh, I always will leave space for someone having done the right thing. I've got a lot of friends at Cap One. They're a, a, a really great institution. And I'm sure there was an element of we're going to do the right thing. But do you, take into account the fact that your competitors are getting rid of this, that consumers now expect this to not exist, and that you've got a regulator with the CFPB. On the same day Cap One announced it, there was a big report from the CFPB about how harmful overdrafts are and how bad they are for banks to engage in. Um, I I think those competitive forces and those regulatory forces are actually really driving dynamic change in consumer financial products in a way that we're not seeing in other markets. And limiting it to, is it easy for a fintech to get a charter, I think misses some of the dynamism that that, that non-bank versus bank uh, competition is generating yeah. in the US market. No, I get yeah, that. I mean, um, when, when, you know, I, it reminds me of that Winston Churchill quote, though, that, um, you know, uh, Americans will always will, will always do the right thing once they've exhaust, exhausted yeah, every all other the option. other options. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, uh, it, it, but it wasn't that long ago that um, others in, in your space, well, you know, in the aggregation space or open banking space, we, you know, where Wells and um, Chase, you know, were, were saying, no, the data is ours, it's not customers, you know, and so I'm glad we've got that out of the way, um, but it, it, it wasn't through one of trying from the big brands to sort of slow this, this down, but Raja, you, you were going to jump in there with something. Well, what I think is really interesting is that some of these fintech use cases, it, it actually is creating good business for some of the traditional financial institutions. Um, a good example of this is thinking about the credit invisible population. So I think there was a there is a, a stat which is one in five Americans today are credit invisible. I, I think there was actually an article that came out this past week in the New York Times that said 45 million people have thin or non-existent credit history, which is more than 15% of the country's adult population. I mean, this is a massive market opportunity. And open banking and open finance actually enables better data accumulation that actually allows for curated solutions that may be able to offer to these people who traditionally would have fallen outside of the normal banking system. That wouldn't have happened without what happened with FinTech, the innovation that was there and the ability to access these consumers, which in and of itself is this tremendous opportunity for traditional banks also to start accepting some of these newer alternative methods. Because if you think about like FICO score, I don't think the 
um, algorithm to uh, deliver it has been updated in call it 30 years or so. Um, that's just not the reality in today's world. Um, and the ability to continue to grow, continue to build, continue to drive new products is enabled because of this fintech innovation. No, I agree. It's certainly putting pressure on the market. So, um, John, I wanted to get into um, a bit more of the policy stuff. Um, you know, we talked about China and the increased um, uh, attention there. Um, but, um, you know, we see a lot of these guys now IPOing. Where do you think the big policy changes have come in, in the last couple of years? Um, you know, and do you think that that's accelerated because of the pandemic? Uh, yes, I absolutely think it has accelerated because of the pandemic. And, and really here, I think the helpful framing for me as someone who spent a decent amount of time in government is government is a very powerful but big and slow tool. So you only want to use it when you're sure something is going to stick. And so what I think we've seen this year is the regulatory agencies in the U.S. market looking at open banking and saying, we don't think this is ephemera, right? We don't think this is a one-time short-term thing. This is a fundamental shift of financial services from analog to digital, and we now need to update all of our regulations to accommodate that shift. In terms of specifics, um, I think there have been two, let me actually say three things that are quite significant that happened this year. The first was the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau put out an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking on a Dodd-Frank 1033 rule which sent a signal to the market that you know, a rule is coming most likely. Also the questions they asked sent a signal about sort of what to expect in that rule. Um, one of the most interesting things that I saw, I, I know you, you mentioned before sort of the banks coming around to the idea that it's the consumer's data. Well, at, at Plaid, we believe it's the consumer's data wherever it is, right? It doesn't just have to be at a bank, it can be at any financial services provider. It's the consumer's data. And Roger was talking about sort of banks seeing the value of this. I think that was part of it also. Like once the CFPB signaled they were going in this direction and signaled that they might sort of adopt some of the same perspective that Plaid has is it's the consumer's data wherever it is. Banks start saying, oh, maybe a consumer can share their fintech data with us and I can build a really new, exciting product out of that. And that, that reciprocity and universality of data started to sink in in January. Then uh, the Biden White House issued an executive order later in the year around May saying competition is more abundant in the United States. We need more of it. It gave one instruction to the CFPB on competition, get 1033 done, right? And when you see the CFPB saying, in fact, when they announced, they just announced an overdraft, uh, this overdraft study, they said, in a world with open banking and more competition, consumers won't be stuck with bank accounts that harvest fees for them, right? right? So now you've got this real competition layer being added on in a sense that consumers will do better with more robust competition and open banking is the source of that more robust competition. And then the final development is um, just recently, actually most people have not paid attention to this, the CFPB sent out a data request to a number of large tech companies. And that was really starting to sort of push on the edges of who's gonna be covered by an open banking and open data rule, right? Is it just gonna be banks or is it going to be anyone who is a financial service provider? And that again has started, started to sort of shift this understanding of, are we going to have a narrow open banking rule in the US or are we going to have a really big, vibrant open finance uh, ecosystem here to build on? That, that's really what's happened over the course of this year. Yeah, um, I think one of the um, interesting pieces of this is you look at, you know, PSD2 obviously, you know, uh, pushed the open banking agenda there. You, in, in Europe, you know, we needed, um, uh, you know, the privacy regulations, GDPR, to, to sort of back that up in, in many respects, because once you start dealing with access to data, you have to have, a, a, you know, some principles in place for that. Um, so I, it's good to see the US sort of catching up in terms of that regulation. One area that I think, um, I don't know, we've got to have a break shortly, but one area that I don't see much work on in the US or Europe right now as yet is artificial intelligence regulation, the way AI will process your data, 
China is, uh, you know, is ahead of the curve on that that front right now. Um, but do you see any um, messaging on on that front, John, in terms of regulation of AI? Uh, so I'm starting to see a little bit. Uh, it, it's mostly along the lines of. Um, be aware that your AI is not exempt from the law, right? Because uh, sometimes you see the idea of like, right. well, if if John Pitts decided he didn't want to lend to this person because of the color of their skin, that's a crime. But if the computer decided it, uh, I'm not so sure, like those silly computers, you can't ask them uh, to, to do better than that. I think there's been some pretty strong early messaging that when it comes to fair lending and fair outcomes for consumers, AI is not an excuse to deviate from existing understanding right. and practice. You can't hide your bias, policy bias, and so yeah. forth in, in an algorithm. Yeah, yeah the computer so. did it is not an excuse, right? <laughs> uh, it, it's the people, not the computers. How, that said, I, I do not think we are anywhere close to what I've seen in Europe and uh, China developing, where it is a sort of top down, you know, we are going to regulate how your algorithm could work. I think there's more energy for that in like the social media space, but it really has not started to trickle out from that area. And even there, it's relatively nascent. Absolutely. John, um, you know, we're still, we're still dealing with the whole pandemic thing, Omicron hitting us right now. Um, you know, it doesn't look like we're gonna be out of the woods on that for, for still a while yet. Um, but do, do you think that, um, you know, the sort of mindset is changing from one where we're going to get back to normal versus um, that this sort of digitization is a permanent shift? Because I think there's still some hoping that, the, you know, that once all the dust settles from pa the pandemic that, yeah, people are going to go back to branches and back to signing pieces of paper and all that sort of stuff. But um, do you think that we're more accepting of that? Uh, so uh, I hope we go back to normal for a lot of things. I really enjoy seeing my parents in person. I really like eating at restaurants. Digital financial services is not reversing. Just to give you some numbers to the first point I made earlier, it, it's not just that digital finance is now more ubiquitous than Netflix in the US. It's that that growth went from 58% of American consumers to 88% of American consumers in a single year. Uh, that is massive growth. And those same consumers report they like it more and they don't plan on coming back. And I know we need to go to break now, but hopefully uh, right after break, we can start talking about sort of what's coming next because Raja, I, I really want to hear don't from you. Don't steal my this. thunder, dude. Don't steal my thunder. I will. I will. All right. <laughs> Let me host. Let me do the host thing. Fine. Well, then, we, we, <laughs> Raja, I just hope that there's an opportunity at some point for us to talk about like, given that this shift is permanent, how do we make sure no one gets left behind by this shift? How do we make sure that it is inclusive and that like the mid-market banks who don't have a billion dollar technology budget get to benefit from this as well? Is that, that, is that, an, is that all right, Brett? Is that, is that a safe enough transition to the... <laughs> I, mean, I, 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 just, could, I, just I could just a, leave you guys to it. You could just talk about it amongst yourselves. No, I'm just joking. Go ahead, Roger. Well, well hey, look, look I'll, I'll just leave you with a couple leftover stats. I think um, in addition to that kind of movement, we're also seeing true value. So um, what we saw from a survey is that 93% of people are actually saving time because of fintech. And 78% said it saved them more money. So fintech use is actually at that inflection point that we can demonstrate how it has positive real impact on consumers' lives. And for that reason, consumers' expectations are changing and people are expecting their money and financial data to be available instantly wherever they want it. So this is certainly uh, uh, here to stay. Awesome. Well, I think that's a good point to uh, have a break on. And after the break, we'll be back talking about what comes next. What can we expect for 2022 and beyond in respect to these changes that we've seen and how that's going to influence the market and uh, you know what what it's going to mean for consumers in the space generally you're listening to breaking banks i'm your host brett king we'll be right back after these words from our sponsors welcome back to breaking banks 
I'm your host, Brett King, and joining me today in the studio, the virtual studio, is uh, Raja Chakravarti and uh, John Pitts from Plaid. And we've been talking about some of the trends that happened in 2021 and uh, 2020 in terms of digitization, some of the changes in policy. Um, but let's jump into 2021 and beyond. Um, so, um, Raja, you know, we, we, we've seen these um, challenger banks essentially come out of nowhere now to be household names around the world. Uh, you know, we have Varo and Chime and Current here that are, are doing very well in the US, but, you know, the big plays, um, you know, uh, you, you've got Revolut in 26 countries now, um, New Bank, who has 40 million customers in the Latin American uh, segment, many of them it, where it's their first bank account, so financially included for the first time. We Bank in Shenzhen with 200 million customers, that's twice the size of JP Morgan Chase's retail business with a 88 million customers. So, um, you know, the, the question uh, I guess people are asking is, um, you know, when is it that we get to the point where not that um, digital only banking is a reality, because I think that's the reality now, but where, you know, people's preferences are shifting to digital banks versus incumbents. When, when do you think we were, are we approaching that point? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, as you mentioned, I mean, we are seeing fintech adoption beginning to approach traditional banking levels today. Um, it's becoming the primary way consumers are managing their money. Banks are digitizing at scale. We certainly believe that most financial services will take place online over the next several years. Like that, that is that is certainly uh, certainly true. And the reality is that's actually good for the consumer as well. And so the ability to shop for the best products that suit their individual needs while being managed interoperably. It's a tremendous boon for consumers and their financial health. Um, you know, I think the, the, the really interesting thing about this segment um, of banks, these neo banks, of course, they are the rage right now, but they also face challenges. They need to think of ways to expand beyond niche or targeted services for one. Um, they need to develop strategies for new customer acquisition, effectively investment and expanding their TAM. That's certainly another area. Um, and while these banks are primarily digital, I think they really need to establish vectors for trust and safety that they may not yet have earned. So investments in things like data privacy and digital identity management is key. And I think those things need to happen before we really start to see that transition at scale. Um, but certainly we're seeing it. Um, I will just you know, kind of put in this plug that digital isn't the only option. Um, one of the things we're obviously seeing is that some bank branches are reopening out of the pandemic and this is going to have a place. Um, and in fact, if you talk to community banks and some of the smaller banks, I think the ability to be kind of in the community and really understand the nuanced experiences like local communities face day in, day out is what really makes them valuable. And I think there's always going to be groups of uh, people who continue to desire this and that there's always going to be this place for this type of banking. But because of this kind of advent of neobanks coming in and starting to um, offer kind of hyper-focused services, what we probably are going to see is that these services that are provided, even at kind of that local community level for traditional financial institutions, they're only going to become more digital in nature. Um, and overall, though, that is just better for the consumer. I agree. No, I think, you know, the way I've said it, you know, I've, I've been tagged as the death of branch guy since I wrote a book called Branch Today Gone Tomorrow back in 2012. But, um, you know, I've always maintained branches will still be here, but banks that rely on branches for revenue won't be right, because uh, they'll be consolidated out. Um, so, you know, there are some good examples of, like you speak, like Citizens Bank of Edmonds that we had on the show um, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, a few times in respect to what they're doing. Um, you know, there, there are a few players that have uh, have certainly taken that hybrid approach to, to heart. Um, so um, I, I guess, um, you know, we, we have seen large financial institutions probably get through the pandemic better with the fact that they have digital onboarding, they have um, improved their service uh, infrastructure around the technology stuff. It's not quite at the level of WeBank, which handles 98% of their service requests with artificial intelligence. But, you know, we have seen obviously technology being used for, for that sort of thing. Um, when, when we look at 
that in in the broader market sense. Um, you know, I, I think you know the pl players like J.P. Morgan Chase and those guys have have done pretty well in the U.S. market. Larger banks in the U.K. Um, scrambling a bit, you know, compared to the challenges there. Um, the Chinese, you know, the the top six Chinese banks have done very well, you know, blockchain cores and all this sort of stuff, uh, you know, uh, they've really been forced to adapt more, more quickly. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of choice of digital, is it sort of polarizing now between people going for the large FIs in the US and or, and or the fintechs? And where does that leave the, the smaller community banks who do lag in respect to things like digital onboarding? Maybe, John, you want to jump in first with that? Uh, so I'll jump in very briefly because I think this is one where Raj's work is just directly okay, solving sorry. the problem. No, no, but, well, no, but I, 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 I want to... Let me state what I think the problem is, and then Raja can talk about how we need to solve that problem. Because the problem is, is a real problem, which is if we transition into digital in a way where whether you get digital financial services depends on where you bank, then we are going to see a ecosystem where there are digital haves and digital have-nots. And frankly, the reason I joined Plaid was because the existing financial system creates a lot of have-nots, people who don't have credit reports, people who can't get a loan, people who won't, don't have a bank who's willing to open an account for them. If the solution to that is transformation to digital, but that transformation means that some FIs and it, their customers are left behind, then it hasn't been a worthwhile transition. And right. so the goal is, how do you get everyone through this digital transformation, not just the largest institutions? Uh, because there is a real equity issue if you don't make that transition for everyone. And then, Raja, maybe you can talk about like what you're doing and what Plaid is doing on building out that infrastructure through sort of the mid-market and the longer tail. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think an important concept to think about is how the challenges differ. Um, between these different kind of segments of business. So um, we kind of talked about those large financial institutions. You know, they built large customer bases over time. Their main challenge, I think, is figuring out how to remain the primary consumer touch point for all financial needs. Um, and so, you know, to John's point, what we tend to see here is this heavy investment to build out and retain that position, um, as well as thinking about how to make that investment sustainable. So um, you're seeing them think through ways to reduce their fixed cost of their technology, um, heavy investment in building proprietary APIs, um, ways to fully digitize their banking core through a lot of in-house methods to remove third-party dependencies, um, as well as focuses on kind of improving or automating customer support and building out kind of like advanced fraud and support tooling. Um, the flip side is that in the long tail kind of community banks and credit unions, which we just talked about, which offer niche services or serve niche markets, they too have a lot of credibility and very loyal customers. But in the current environment, they don't really, well, one, they want to ensure they don't leave their members behind. And they tend to have limited resources and generally take a longer time to build out these new solutions due to resource constraints. Right. And I think these banks actually believe they may be well served by scaled solution providers. They just need to find the right ones who can meet them where they are. And then finally, kind of in that middle, you've got this mid-tier, they're feeling this high pressure to innovate given the squeeze from big banks and neobanks. Um, and they're really in it for this battle for account primacy. There's all of this pressure that's coming through. And so their focus is on digitizing their workflow across the banking stack with high investments in personalization as a differentiator. And you might realize this through things like expansion of lending or underwriting tools. The types of things that Plaid is investing in is actually oriented very much to address financial institutions where they are and meet them where they are. Um, you know, our, our business is really oriented around an expertise in financial data APIs. Um, and we understand that many FIs are at different stages in their API journey. So the tools that we are building um, are really focused on that. So one example of a tool is Plat Exchange, which is an open finance platform that makes it easy for all financial institutions, regardless of size and scale, to enable data access on behalf of their customers via APIs. And it's an integration that kind of connects directly into this large network that Plat has, which connects, you know, 5,000 plus 
uh, uh, financial technology companies with over 12,000 financial institutions um, and enables access to this kind of two-way uh, stream of data. Um, I think notably what we have been focused on is ensuring that it is uh, built with an adherence to some of the industry standards and the way the market is going and ensuring that we are building things cognizant of really important aspects for these companies recognizing they may not have the ability to invest in a lot of things like an interoperable specification that allows aggregation methodologies to work across the board. And so certainly this is a major focus area for us, uh, but we think that there are different ways to meet these uh, to meet these banks and that they all can be served through um, just focused efforts. Um, I'd like to throw this one at you guys. Um, you know, uh, two, two things emerged, I think, this year in respect to differentiation, um, which we've seen across the board. One is generally just financial wellness. You know, we see, um, you know, Goldman Sachs Marcus with Apple, a real focus on categorization and what you're spending and how you're spending. Google went one step further with showing you predictive cash flow, talking about bills that you have coming up in the Google wallet. So there's definitely been a, an increased attention on financial wellness, which is great for, for you know, moving my, my startup that sort of was, was founded on that basis. But the other thing is crypto custody. We've seen uh, the likes of NIDIG into the market and a lot more talk about crypto custody. Crypto now is a three trillion dollar asset class. Um, you know, if you want to, if you want to categorize it that way, um, what do you guys think? Is there other differentiations that I'm missing with the sort of digital digitization piece, or what do you think comes next? So, I think one of the key areas for differentiation coming next is going to be interoperability, right? And, and I actually think this is this is a challenge that most people are not looking at yet because they're th still thinking about sort of how to get their institution to be able to offer all of these services. I mean, you just talked about crypto, right? Right now, the race is how can I myself enable my customers to engage in, in crypto investing, crypto trading? I think there's going to be a pretty fast dead end to that strategy where mm -hmm. everyone building their own version of everything is going to fall apart very right. quickly, be very expensive. And the, the institutions that think the first and the fastest about how do I work best with other institutions? How do I connect best? Even if I'm not doing everything for my customer. The, the ecosystem. Do, yeah. Right, how do right. I make my customer's ability to connect to a broad ecosystem easier than any of my competitors? I think that's where the real winners are going to start emerging from this because that network effect becomes tied to your institution and your customer relationship. And I think the customer is gonna value that network value more than they value the sort of individual offerings you have. And so I see that interoperability as a real differentiation challenge that is gonna be sort of the next level of infrastructure and, and digital finance challenge that we're just starting to sort of touch the beginnings of right now but is, is not really, no one's really come to grips with it yet. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's faster and cheaper, right? So, Roger, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think um, kind of an interesting augmentation of this actually considers this general blurring of the line between digital and physical. Um, and we certainly talk about this frequently in payments and financial services. Um, we haven't spoken about this much today, but embedded finance is becoming a burgeoning area of growth. Um, and when we think about the physical world and how digital solutions are being utilized there and think about these other innovations, which in theory have um, tremendous impact into how people buy and sell services, goods, access to healthcare, whatever you have, um, the, the ability to create an interoperability around all of these use cases with a financial management angle on top of it is absolutely going to be critical. And as you kind of look at the future and as that starts to get more and more digital, um, there's not really going to be this like, oh, what is this crypto use case? Or what is this 
finance use case or what is this commerce use case, it's all going to be one and the same. And I think it's all going to ultimately be embedded. And just to build on that a little bit, like just to continue going down this interoperability theme, I think there's another differentiation that comes with that interoperability, Brett, and that is differentiating on trust in an interoperable world, right? You know, we're used to a world of standalone banks and also brick and mortar banks, the branches. When I think of a bank branch, even though this is not really true anymore, the one image that comes to my head is a vault, right? And I'm sure that's true for most people as you like, what is a bank at, at heart? It's a vault. And what is a vault? A vault is trust. When you put your money here, the money doesn't leave. Well, in that interoperable world that Raja just uh, described, data is moving to lot between lots of different institutions. And how do you trust that they are all being held to a very high data security standard and privacy standard so that you can have confidence that in moving from A to B or B to C, you're not suddenly putting your data at risk or you know having different rights, different uh, remedies. What's the vault for that interoperable world look like? And you know we've we've made an effort at this. We recently announced the open finance data security standard with a bunch of security partners and other tech companies. That's a way to set a scalable uh, standard for everyone who's engaged in digital finance to have security that sort of matches their risk profile and matches everyone from a one person startup to an enterprise company. Uh, I think that type of differentiation on trust is gonna become incredibly important in that interoperable world as sort of the next phase of making consumers really confident in engaging in this ecosystem. Yeah, and I would say the, the John's nailed that. Trust, safety, and security are what are underpinning a lot of the work that we are doing. Um, I might add one additional piece, which is control. Uh, and so the ability for a consumer, because there are so many different avenues for that vault to be deployed, their ability to control, turn on and off the spigot, to be able to understand exactly what has been provisioned where is another key element that when you put those kind of other pieces together becomes, I think, the defining uh, mechanism by which um, this environment will move forward. Well, you know, I, I, I agree to some extent, but I also think um, trust is defined increasingly in a digital world by utility. Right? If you look at why Alipay and Tencent WeChat Pay are so trusted in China, more trusted than banks, actually, is because the, the technology works every time. Even at, you know, like think about Singles Day that they just had in in China, eighty five. Well, yeah, bil- what was their volume dollars. this year for it? Yeah, eighty five billion. 85 billion. And and they're doing transactions at, at your five hundred thousand transactions per second. Visa has a theoretical limit or um, you know a transaction limit of thirty two thousand transactions per second. Alipay is doing four hundred and eighty thousand or something per second, right? With one ten thousandth of the fraud that um, we get on card not present transactions, right? So 0.0006 basis points of fraud for Alipay versus 11.2 basis points of fraud in North America for card not present. So um, that's, you know, if you can do, do electronic digital stuff, payments and the banking and access to credit, and you can do that high speed, instantly, real time, without issues, because you've got a new tech stack, as an example, versus, uh, you know, trying to have a hybrid stack with a core that you, you know, you originally built in the 70s or something. I, I do think utility is, is also a, a component of this trust element. Yeah, I agree, Brett. And and really that comes down to scalability, right? And this is where next year gets so exciting. In fact, you know, we've even seen some banks uh, that sort of with a lot of hoopla introduced their APIs uh, in the last year say, well, we have an API, but we're also going to impose a hard cap on how many API calls can happen at our bank this year. And that's not a scalable approach to the ecosystem. That's, that's crazy. Not- yeah. That's like... <laughs> Like, can you imagine a fintech saying that? That's just insane. Right. Or anyone saying that, like, actually, like, across the entire user base for this product, we're, we're going to set a limit. And we don't know, even though the ecosystem is growing, we're going to set a limit based on what we're seeing today. That, that's, that's not going to be sustainable. It's not and the I think, digital scalable world. Right? No. And, and that's where, actually, I think Plaid and others who are digital native have a lot to offer 
because if there's anything that that our stack is good at and that many of our customer stacks are good at it is this notion of rapid and and accurate scaling right scaling without loss of quality and i think that's something that will be really important for fi's in the next couple of years is taking on that tech mentality of iterate until you've got something and then as soon as you've got it, the scale is the really big driver of success and trust and all those other things. So I, I just really vehemently agreeing with you, Brett, on that right. point of, of functionality being key to trust. I think, the, I think the story on top of that is it ultimately comes down to the consumer, right? We talked about that stat where fintech usage went from 58% right, last they're already year to 88%. Yeah. They're already choosing it and, it's, and, and it has become expectation. And if you look at that 30 point growth over the last year, like it is only going up. And so this arbitrary imposition of hard caps just is ignoring what the consumer sentiment looks like. And ultimately for um, institutions that decide not to uh, understand what consumer expectation is going to be, I think that's gonna be incredibly limiting for them going forward. Um, yeah. So certainly uh, I, I, I would double stamp that agreement from John. All right. Well, you know, I mean, look, the, the fact is, you know, I don't, it doesn't matter where you look, transfer wise, uh, Coinbase, um, you know, the challenger neobanks, um, the, the Chinese mobile wallets, all of the fastest growing um, institutions in the world today are digital scaled right, a digital scaling. And we're not talking about the fact that they're the fastest growing institutions because they're so small and they're growing, you know, they're growing rapidly. These are now have larger user bases than the conventional or incumbent companies in this space, and they're still growing fast and rapidly. So digital scaling is where it's at. It's going to have to reshape market share. There's, there's, there's no other logical interpretation of that. But I, you know, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact we're running out of time on this. So let's let's get into 2022 and, and what are going to be the big themes for 2022 in, in uh, the fintech space? Um, you know, what, what are some of the big bets? Roger, you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. And in fact, I think we, uh, we did a good job here talking about them. Um, I think there's just a, a couple key areas. The first is financial inclusion. So building new financial products, and then ensuring that consumers can go through kind of that front door to benefits from these products is, to say the least, a, a complex process. It often relies on accessing customers' permission financial data for things like bank transactions, account balances, investments, credit cards. Um, but underpinning it all is fair, reliable, and secure API-based data exchange. So that's why it remains certainly for Plaid. One of our top priorities is the industry moves full steam towards this fully digital financial system. Um, and then the second area for me is really oriented around credit and data access that's coming into focus. Um, you know, we talk about our mission being to unlock financial freedom for everyone. Um, and we also believe fundamentally in a more inclusive credit system. Uh, and we've talked a lot about that today, but we're seeing kind of the beginning stages of the industry looking beyond traditional methods to assess an individual's credit worthiness. And, and that inflection point is happening that's right really now. really important because it's, yeah. it's, yeah. that's important for financial inclusion when people don't have that credit history. And it's also critical for offshore where, you know, they don't necessarily have the, well, you know, even the credit scoring system here in the U.S. is, is groaning you know, in terms of its, uh, it, it, its accuracy and capabilities and so forth. And the pandemic, um, you know, is, is, is not going to make any of that easier. John, what are your big bets for 2022? Uh, so my biggest bet is Dodd-Frank 1033. I think it's coming next year as a full rule. This is going to be the rules of the road for digital finance going forward. If you're not paying attention Ooh, you got a, a about a month or two to really ramp up and get ready for it. That's that by what, far is the biggest bet. What about offshore? Uh, offshore, I think in Europe we're going to see uh, a shift to open finance. I think there's a general consensus that open banking has been insufficient uh, in terms of what they did, and there's going to be some retrenchment there. And then I I think one of the next big things that many countries are going to start tackling next year is digital identity. India has really has led to. the pack. We have like, to. India yeah. has established a digital identity in a way that no other country has other than China, but I don't think any, many other countries want to replicate the Chinese model of, of digital identity. 
Um, but I think the question of digital identity and digital identity that persists across institutions and maybe even across jurisdictions is a huge challenge that we're gonna start seeing uh, real work put to next year. In, in a digital world where you've got a digital services layer, digital identity is a precursor for access to digital services. But more importantly than that, your driver's license and your passport and your mother's maiden name, your date of birth, your address and your social security number, those data points are no longer securable, right? The data that we have on those documents is no longer securable. We must have biometrics. So, you know, I, like I get the whole thing about China and the uh, civil rights, but we can't have digital identity without biometrics, surely, can we? Uh, no, I agree. I think biometrics is gonna be a key point. I, I guess my point was, uh, I'm not sure that most uh, countries are willing to have a government tell them who they are. I think many places you want to be able to represent to the government who you are. And by so, so what? You, so should we that, have yeah. should we have Facebook Meta build it? <laughs> uh, I I think there's a big question of who builds it and how it gets built. Right. But I think next year is uh, is, is the, the year way we have, we have to really sort it out. You're right. We it have has to, to be solved. Sort it out. Yeah. And it's a yeah. big, big open opportunity next year. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, apart from Plaid, obviously, you guys have done really well over the last couple of years. But um, who should we be watching in terms of players for 2022 that excite you? I think it's less about players for me and more about the innovations that we just talked about. So certainly kind of in that digital identity management, I think there is just so much opportunity for us to see new things. Certainly, again, around credit um, and financial inclusion, um, certainly we're already seeing a lot of advances that are happening there. Um, and certainly um, there are there is much more to go. Um, so it, to me, it's really more about capabilities, um, but uh, I'm very excited. Um, I did just say the last thing that that I've been observing, um, you actually talked about it right at the very beginning. I think um, 2020 uh, had $166 billion of uh, venture capital investment into fintech. This year, I think we're going to end at about $240 billion. So mm -hmm. the trends are massive in terms of continued investment because of what we've already seen in terms of the actual impact that's happening on uh, consumer financial life. Um, so I'm very excited to see how it continues to grow. Indeed, indeed. Well, um, Raja and John, thanks for joining us again. Um, for, those, for those that are interested in Plaid from a platform perspective, they'd like to you know, join the ecosystem, where can they go to find out more information? Uh, you can follow me at the single most embarrassing Twitter handle known to man, uh, Policy Pits. That's where I tweet on all things fintech policy. Uh, that's probably the best place to reach me. Or if you have a question and want to send it directly to Plaid, feel free to send it to plaid-exchange at plaid.com. Very cool. Well, um, guys, thanks again for joining us. And, uh, you know, if I haven't... Uh, haven't you know i don't get the chance to speak to you before the end of the year um hope your uh, end of year with your, your family times is uh, fulfilling and positive and happy and uh, i look forward to um doing this again in in 2022 sometime really looking forward to it brett happy holidays maybe and, having uh, you as a co-host at some point John. you <laughs> seem so good at it already i can't wait to see that thanks so much brett. really appreciate the time all right. Thanks. You're listening to Breaking Banks. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we will see you again next week. That's it for this week. If you like the show, make sure to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform or share it with a friend or share it on social media. We'll see you again next week with more Breaking Banks.